Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this Society for Libyan Studies lecture. Um, just some preliminary information before we start. So this webinar, webinar will be recorded and it will be available to watch via the Society for Libyan Studies website for anyone who may have missed the live event tonight. Um, after the talk, there will be some time for discussion. So if anyone has any questions for the speaker, please can you type your question in the Q&A box and I will read the question to the speaker. Please use uh, the Q&A box. Don't use the chat uh, box. So I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Peter Nagy, who's an art historian and archaeologist of the Islamic world with a background in Arabic textual sources. Peter completed a master's degree at the University of Oxford in 2016, which was sponsored by the Ertegun Graduate Scholarship. This prepared the ground for his subsequent doctoral research in the Faculty of, of Oriental Studies at Oxford, which he completed in 2021 with a dissertation on Marinid patronage at the site of Shalla, also known as Shalla, and the history of royal funerary architecture in Islamic Morocco. Indeed, Moroccan Islamic architecture as represented Peter's principal area of investigation throughout his academic research, a topic on which he has published several articles. Besides, Peter is also interested in the modern discovery and reception of Islamic architecture, looking at how these buildings were studied, perceived, and sometimes imitated in Europe in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Finally, as part of his collaboration with the National Museum of Qatar, he's investigating royal palaces built in this region during the 20th century. His presentation tonight will take us back to his original work on the Islamic architecture of Morocco with a, type, with a talk titled, Shalla as a site of royal presence, constructing the Sultanic image in 14th century Morocco. So without further ado, Peter, the digital floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Nicolo, not only for the kind and generous introduction, but especially for the opportunity for inviting me to talk today. It is a great honor to discuss part of my research, part of my doctoral research, in fact, uh, to the Society for Libyan Studies. <clears throat> On the 30th of March, 2019, Pope Francis landed in Rabat, beginning his two day long visit in Morocco as the guest of the King Mohammed VI. Among the places where he appeared to the public was a highly symbolic location, the Hassan Mosque. Originally established by the al Muhad Caliph, Yaqub al Mansur in the late 12th century, today the site forms an open esplanade with stubs of columns dominated by a monumental, even though never completed, Minaret. For the occasion of the Pope's visit, a stage was set up at the south end of the Esplanade, from where both Muhammad VI and Pope Francis delivered a speech, accentuating the importance of peaceful and tolerant coexistence of different beliefs. Then the ceremony continued with a visit to the mausoleum of Muhammad V, the grandfather of the present King of Morocco, located at the southeast corner of the Esplanade, on the left side in this image. This place plays a prominent role in today's royal ceremonies, thereby contributing to the public image of the Alawi dynasty, the dynasty ruling Morocco since the mid 17th century. Since its inauguration in 1971, the tomb of Muhammad V has witnessed numerous foreign kings, presidents and prime ministers who are always taken there when on a state visit to Morocco. As was the case with Pope Francis, such events are observed by thousands of people who are present in person, not to mention the many more who could follow the live streaming on the YouTube channel 
of Vatican news. King Muhammad VI also pays regular visits to the tomb of his grandfather and father, Al Hassan II, usually in the company of state dignitaries and family members, something that I guess you could describe as a work meeting, in this case, precociously following COVID rules. In addition to in addition, the site is continuously flocked by tourists, locals and foreigners alike, who can visit it free of charge and then leave with an impression of a carefully designed image of the current ruling dynasty. The architectural complex makes unmistakable references to the, to the Moroccan kingdom's historical origins, the deceased ruler's sanctity and the current ruler's piety and patronage. What is, however, less recognized is that the operation of the tomb of Muhammad V reaches back to an age old tradition. Several similar royal funerary complexes exist from different periods in the history of Morocco and the wider region, among which the site of Sharla, built mostly in the first half of the 14th century, can rightfully be claimed the earliest. In my talk today, I hope to demonstrate that Sharla once functioned as a place of royal presence similar to the tomb of Muhammad V in present-day Morocco, consciously designed for contributing to the sultanate image, or in other words, to the people's perception of the current dynasty. The first part of my paper will address the archeology span of the royal funerary complex at Shalla, providing a synopsis of the process of reconstructing its history, mainly through the method of building archeology. span then I shall turn to the contemporary operation and perception of the site as described by visitors in the 14th century. I'm also aiming to give a general insight into the site, a place that not only was unprecedented in Morocco, but also subsequently set a model for later dynasties in the region. Today, Shalla is an archaeological site featuring ancient and Islamic remains and serving as a popular tourist attraction situated just outside the walls of Rabat. It offers many different research opportunities, not least for historians of Islamic architecture. Several imposing, if ruinous buildings have survived above the ground, while others have been unearthed through excavations. The ramparts encompass an irregular slope of about 64,000 square meters at the lowermost part of which stands the funerary complex with its northwest facade stretching about 52 meters in length. Most Islamic buildings are known to date from the Marine period, erected by the dynasty that ruled Morocco from the mid 13th century to the late 15th century. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus strictly on those contiguous buildings in the ensemble, even though several other contemporary structures can be identified both around the funerary complex and elsewhere within the ramparts. To orient ourselves, we should first look through the complex briefly. The two major buildings are the mosque and this building commonly and misleadingly known as the madrasa. The mosque is surrounded by a courtyard, uh, which you see on the northwest side here. There is an ablution pool and a small minaret near the south corner, whereas behind the mosque to the southeast is where the funerary courtyard with several tombs is situated. Between the mosque and the madrasa, so-called madrasa that is here, is a square hole, a burial hole, with numerous graves excavated underneath the current pavement. The so-called madrasa occupies the northeast part of the funerary complex, also incorporating a minaret in its north corner, that is right here, and a prayer hall on the Qibla or southeast side, side. Visitors to the funerary complex can easily realize that the buildings have undergone multiple stages of modification, addition, demolition, expansion, reconstruction, and modern restoration. Few structures are contemporary with their neighbor, and even individual walls tend to indicate several construction phases. Yet, while scholars occasionally mention the relevance of building archeology span to the understanding of the site, no such study has been conducted prior to, to, to the beginning of my PhD research. 
Previous work focused whether on textual sources or on excavations with little or no regards to the standing structures, even though it is surely necessary to clarify the building's chronology before engaging with any further investigation. The main question that I hope to answer is from what point in history can we find evidence for the existence of a proper funerary complex, which I'm going to explain later. This part of my talk results from the archaeological survey I carried out as Charla in 2018, partly with the assistance of other extremely helpful and knowledgeable colleagues. Our work included systematic documentation of the funerary complex with the method of 3D photogrammetry, which required taking over 8,000 photographs that covered every inch of the structures and then processing a georeferenced three-dimensional model of the complex. In addition, I also concentrated on the archaeological analysis of the standing buildings. By distinguishing the variant construction materials and techniques visible on the walls, I aim to identify, to identify contexts or stratigraphic units and then arrange them into construction phases on the basis of their stratigraphic relationships with each other, thereby reconstructing the site's chronology. Yet, in the present talk, I must avoid uh, avoid unfolding all details because that would be extremely tedious. Instead, I'm presenting here the main results of my analysis. The mosque is the most complete surviving building within the complex, constituting three aisles running parallel with the Qibla or southeast wall. Here, the basic question is how many construction phases can be discerned from the masonry, which is best observable on the outside of the Tibla wall. Although there are two mausolea abutting the wall, one here and another one here, and the uppermost part of the same wall uh, results from modern restoration, the analysis indicates four main construction techniques corresponding with four phases. The elevation, this elevation includes my interpretation of the construction phases highlighted in turquoise, pink, purple, and red. The parts left out um, are hidden behind plaster or other decoration, yet the colors reveal more than enough to understand the different phases of the building. Moreover, the same four phases appear in other parts of the mosque. The walls highlighted here in green or share the same four construction phases. And these are the walls surrounding the southeast and the central aisle of the mosque. The only part of the building that stands out is the walls surrounding the northwest aisle, which was apparently built in a single phase, constituting an expansion to the earlier mosque in phase four. In other words, the original mosque can be reconstructed as a simple rectangular structure that was rebuilt at least twice with the same layout, that is phases one, two, and three, although you might know the addition of the minaret near the south corner, most likely in phase two. The reconstructed northwest wall, which of course no longer survives, finds corroboration in the excavated remains of, the ori of this wall uh, right, where, uh, right where it is reconstructed um, and the excavations were taken uh, to place in 1959. Unfortunately, the published material is too poor to be presented here. Then the mosque underwent an expansion in phase four. That is what you see reconstructed here. And if we return to the interpretation of the Qibla wall for a second, we can see some inconsistencies in the masonry here and here highlighted in green. The stratigraphy indicates that originally there were two large rectangular windows in this wall converted into doorways in phase four. The doorways then force provided access to the funerary courtyard situated behind the mosque. So moving to the funerary courtyard, there are three partly surviving ruinous mausolea, square tombs, once covered by domes, two of which stand abutting the Qibla wall of the mosque. 
It is indeed their physical relationship with the mosque, as well as the ground level of their foundation that indicate that they are most likely to date from phase four. As already seen, the two doorways on the Qibla side, on the Qibla wall of the mosque were created at the same time, opening directly next to the mausolea, that is one here and one here. It can even be proposed that one of the mausolea, probably the one on the left, belonged to the Sultan Abu Sa'id, who died in 1331. At least according to textual sources, he was the first to receive a mausoleum above his grave. I should mention briefly that the third mausoleum in this funerary courtyard, this building, according to its foundation inscription, belongs to the Sultan Abu Sa'id, who ruled from 1331 to 1351, and who is generally known as the chief patron of Shalla. The Sultan established his own tomb, presumably towards the end of his life in the 1340s. I will return to him in more detail later. Occupying the northeast part of the funerary complex is a rectangular courtyard flanked by two rows of cells or small rooms along the longer sides. The building incorporates an elongated room and the minaret towards the northwest side, an elongated room and the minaret in the north corner, while at the opposite end over here opens a prayer hall. There is also an ablution building attached to the ensemble from the northeast, what you see here. Although this building is commonly known as the Madrasa of Shalla, this identification is not exactly straightforward especially because the different construction techniques and indeed their stratigraphy indicates two main construction phases corresponding with two different functions. The walls that form structural bonds with each other, masonry bonds, thereby indicated to be contemporary dating from the earlier phase are reconstructed in this site plan. Already in existence are the large courtyard with the minaret the elongated room on the northwest side, the prayer hall to the southeast, and the ablution building. Fortunately, some of the walls linking this building with, with the mosque, as well as other buildings in the funerary complex, uh, indicate that it was built about the same time as the expansion of the mosque, that is phase four, hence the red color. And this building was not a madrasa. The question of what function is fulfilled is not very difficult to answer. A contemporary author, Ibn Marzouk, mentions the construction of a mosque and a zawiya as Shalla in the late 1330s, which matches with the expansion and thorough reconstruction of the mosque and the addition of this new building. So the entire complex in phase four would look something like this. Several other sources indicate, uh, corroborate this um, identification, including this endowment inscription that mentions the Zawiya as Shalla dating uh, around 1340. Such buildings, that is Zawiyas in 14th century Morocco, were primarily intended for housing pious visitors who came to devote themselves to a sacred place. This means that in phase four, there are a heavily rebuilt and expanded mosque, a new zawiya, two mausolea, altogether forming a proper funerary complex with several different functions. Then in a later phase, modifications took place between the zawiya and the mosque that is here, creating a square building, a square burial hall featuring 12 columns, as well as particularly rich decoration from which unfortunately quite little remains. This is the building that we can uh, ascribe to phase five, about the same time when, an, uh, when, the, uh, when the Muslim power Hassan also came into existence. I should add only briefly that the communal burial hall has been, I believe, quite plausibly attributed to the people who died in the Battle of Tarifa in Al-Andalus in Christian Spain in 1340, and were reportedly taken to be buried at Shal, at least in a contemporary source, they are mentioned as the martyrs of Tarifa who are buried at Shalla. Whether this identification is correct or not, dating this square burial hall to the early 1340s 
roughly about the same time as the Muslim of Hassan fits with the relative chronology of the entire complex. Yet still later, the building identified as a Zawiya underwent a partial reconstruction that mainly concerned its inner division walls, adding partitions that separate the cells for students that you can see here and here in yellow. The main evidence for this reconstruction is that the perimeter walls of this building were heightened, while the inner walls forming no structural bond with each other also differ in construction technique and material from everything that had existed before. Given its layout, this reconstructed building was definitely a madrasa. In other words, the former Zawiya was converted into a madrasa in phase six. Accordingly, the contemporary author Ibn al-Hajj and numairi clarifies the date of this phase. According to him, the Madrasa of Shalla was inaugurated in 1354. To sum up this chronology, it emerges that six main phases can be discerned from the history of the funerary complex. The first two of them are mainly attestable in the mosque, i.e. we are dealing with an early Islamic mosque that was reconstructed at least twice. Phase three, the second reconstruction, presumably dates from the early Marinid period, the late 13th century, when the Marinid sultans and their families began to use the surrounding of this mosque as their royal cemetery, when it was also encircled by a perimeter wall. I should emphasize that there is no funerary complex at this stage, unlike in phase four, dated to the 1330s, when the first Mosulia and the Zawiya pop up around the mosque, which also underwent an expansion. Here I'm only highlighting the contrast between these two phases to which I shall return later. So this funerary complex then continued to be expanded and modified in the subsequent decades, adding the mausoleum of Abu Hassan and the communal burial hall, and lastly in phase six, turning the Zawiya into a madrasa. Shalla was the main burial ground of the Marinid dynasty from 1284 to the mid 1350s. According to textual sources, at least five sultans and three of their wives were interred there, not to mention other members of their families, state dignitaries and martyrs. However, as already noted, the sources ascribe all constructions of the funerary complex to the later part of this period, in particular to the reigns of Abu Hassan and Abu Inan, that is between 1331 and 1358. It is thus fair to say that Shalla enjoyed its heyday around the mid 14th century. Indeed, the site's operation at the time arguably highlights how it was meant to fashion the Sultanate image. In parallel with architectural patronage, Abu Hassan and Abu Inan made much effort to advance Shalla's popularity and to emphasize its sanctity. It functioned as a communal place of visitation, commemorating the deceased sultans and thereby encoring a dynastic cult. Among the most important events were the ceremonious funerals, mostly of deceased members of the ruling family. This list highlights the, uh, some of the events, most of the events uh, recorded in the sources that were held in the presence of the current ruler, as well as the crowd of people. So as already mentioned in 1331, Abu Said, the Sultan Abu Said died, who was followed six years later by his wife, Al-Anbar. In 1340, the Battle of Tarifa took place and the people uh, who died there were taken to be buried at Shalla. That there is a bit of a gap in our record, but from 1349, we hear about the funeral of Shams al -Duha was the wife of the Sultan Abu Hassan, followed by the Sultan himself two years later. Lastly, in 1354, from 1354, we have two burials, one um, of uh, Abu Zayyan al suwaidi the former Wazir, and the Hurra al muazzama who was the daughter of Abu Hassan, as well as the sister of Abu Inan. Apart from these events, 
the sultans used to visit Shalla on various occasions. That is, the site was a place where the general public could encounter the rulers, both the deceased and the living. The architecture and operational program of Shalla played an active role in fashioning the dynasty's representation. Thus, the question that arises is what the satanic image entailed, or more precisely, what Shalla presented to the public in that regard. At this point, it is worth highlighting a significant aspect in the theory of Muslim rulership that is a fundamental statement made by many rulers throughout the Islamic world, namely that the Sultan is the shadow of God on earth. This is a subject that many scholars, including Aziz al-Azma and Christian Lang, studied in detail, demonstrating that it also meant that the rulers were, the rulers were expected to capitalize on that principle and act accordingly. The patronage of architecture, for instance, was one of the ways in which a Muslim ruler was able to imitate or mime God's creation, especially if that patronage had a direct reference to the afterlife. The only point that I should add is to this general framework that is very broad and encompassing the entire studies of uh, the, and the entire field of Islamic studies is that the analogy between God and the Sultan equally stands, or at least the claim was made, that it equally stands for the Marinid dynasty. The most informative source for this question is Ibn Marzouk, the historian and private secretary to the Sultan Abul Hassan, who discusses the theory of rulership in the introduction to his eulogy of the Sultan. He quotes several hadith sayings attributed to the Prophet, including that, Whoever helps the Sultan will be helped by God, and the Sultan is the shadow of God on earth. It is in part the analogy between God and the Sultan that, at least according to Ibn Marzouk, made the Baronid Sultan legitimate. Accordingly, Ibn Marzouk points out the Sultan's piety, that the, points out the Sultan's piety by enumerating all the buildings he established throughout his reign. And this brings us back to Shalla and its perception by contemporary visitors who reveal some of the symbolic aspects of the site. I shall highlight that Shalla was construed as a representation of paradise as described in the Quran, as well as an analog of the Kaaba, the holy sanctuary within the mosque of Mecca. One of Shalla's most obvious analogies with paradise was the orchard or garden at the site mentioned in several sources from the Marinid period. Although it no longer survives, the textual evidence allows us to depict it directly behind the funerary complex, exactly where its modern reincarnation planted under the French protectorate is still uh, visible today. This is the, the stretch of land going behind the funerary complex all the way to the east corner. The same is what you see running here. Significantly, two inscriptions that survive in the mausoleum of Abu Hassan are quotations from the Quran, and they provide some hint at the interpretation of this specific garden. So the first one reads, every soul will taste death, and you will only be given your compensation on the day of resurrection. One who is drawn away from the fire and admitted to paradise has succeeded. What is the life of this world except for the enjoyment of delusion? The other one says, gardens of Eden, which the faithful will enter beneath which rivers flow. They will have their reign, whatever they wish. Thus does Allah reward the righteous. Those whom the angels take in death as good saying, peace be upon you, enter the garden for what you used to do. The prime intention of this text was of course to remind the beholder of the images of paradise, the compensation that the sultans allegedly deserve for their piety and deeds. Moreover, some manifest characteristics of the site must have enhanced the visitor's experience, 
suggesting that the deceased physically rested in a place that replicated the Quranic images of the hereafter. While reading the inscription about the garden fed by subterranean rivers, behind the wall inscribed with the text, one could indeed see a garden fed by water from beneath the ground. There is, of course, a uh, all around the funerary complex, an underground system of tunnels dating back to Roman times and reused by the marinid patrons and fed by a natural spring. The Andalusi vizier, Lisan al-Din ibn al-Khatib, who lived at the, and worked at Shalla between 1360 and 1362, composed one of the most informative sources about the site. In his many poems about the place, uh, you can read the following lines. A garden with fragrance diffusing, birds singing and trees with branches weighed down. The rain pours on the place and then the flowers come to life because of its blessings. You, that is Abul Hassan, have placed it in the hands of God, thus divine decrees have become liable for its protection. You have replaced the, tra the transitory palace with an eternal dwelling place beneath which its rivers flow. I should emphasize that Ibn al-Khatib wrote this poem while literally standing at the site, presumably around the mausoleum of Abu Hassan. The line saying, trees with branches weighed down, apart from describing the orchard of Shalla, is likely to allude to the Quranic images of the fruit trees of paradise. Yet more relevant is the expression beneath which its rivers flow, which is a recurrent way of describing paradise in the Quran. It even appears among the above quoted inscriptions in the mausoleum of Abu Hassan. Ibn al-Khatib thus borrowed a Quran expression, while the context of this line makes it clear that he talks not directly about paradise, but the garden of Shalla. In short, it seems that uh, his perception reflected or indeed emerged from the inscriptions and other physical characteristics that he encountered at the spot. Then it is again Ibn al-Khatib who informs us most explicitly about the associations between Shalla and the Kaaba. According to Islamic tradition, no place in the world could, could compete with the Kaaba, also known as the ancient house, in terms of holiness and religious devotion. Yet as demonstrated by scholars, including Simon Omeara and Finbar Barry Flood, this sanctity of the Kaaba did not prevent Muslim patrons from creating its analogues or mimesis in different regions of the Islamic world. Examples, examples could be uh, enumerated from Central Asia to West Africa. But to focus on Shalla, Ibn al-Khatib describes a popular feast on the 27th night of Ramadan, in which the entire site was filled with people who stayed there overnight in tents. He then quotes one of the poems chanted by the visitors, including the following lines. It satisfies me to adopt myself to Shalla, so that its zamzam is my tears and my body is its hatim. Zamzam means the spring within the great mosque of Mecca, right next to the Kaaba, while the Hatim is the name of a shallow semicircular wall uh, abutting the Kaaba that is traditionally known to be part of the building. In fact, you can see the Hatim, this semicircular wall in this image here. In a letter sent from Shalla to the Marinid Sultan in Fez, Ibn al-Khatib highlights an even more direct reference. He says, the domes of sovereignty have been robbed in the curtains of the noble Kaaba, dresses of the ancient house have cloaked the garments of the imams. Ancient house is of course another name for the Kaaba, while the curtain means the kiswa, the black cloth hanging from the building. Imam in this case is a title for the Marinid Sultans. That is, the author claims that the tombs of the Marinid Sultans were decorated with pieces of the Kiswa. In yet another poem about the visitation of Shalla, the same author notes, the pilgrimage rites 
manasik are always followed. Its corner is touched while its appearance makes people shed tears. The Arabic term manasik means specifically the rites of the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. But here Ibn al-Khatib applies it for Shalla. He even adds that the visitors touched a corner, which is traditionally part of the circumambulation around the Kaaba during the pilgrimage. Ibn al-Khatib, along with other visitors who performed those rites, thus consciously associated their experience with the pilgrimage to Mecca. The question that emerges from this discussion is to what end did the Marinid patrons design Shalla as a visual, symbolic, or functional mimesis of the Kaaba and of paradise? As already suggested, part of the rational stemmed from the purported enhancement of the sanctity of the site, whereby they sought to attract visitors to their funerary complex. It is quite clear that the more people attend to the dynastic cult, the more popular the current ruler and generally the dynasty will be. However, there can be an additional explanation to the phenomenon, one that takes into account the status of a Muslim ruler as God's deputy or shadow on earth, which as expected would have reflected in various analogies between them. That is, I would propose that the Sultan's patronage of Shalla, regarding its references to paradise and the Kaaba, imitated the creations of God, consciously elevating the satanic image in line with the common Muslim theory of rulership. To date, the history of Islamic Shalla mostly attracted scholarly interest, focusing on the Marinid period, which is not surprising given that for a few decades in the 14th century, this was the most significant site of royal patronage and representation in Morocco. What is more puzzling is how little research has focused on tracing the development of the funerary complex within this short period, even though the structure stratigraphy surely demands such an investigation. One of the findings of my analysis of building archaeology is that contrary to previous assumptions, no funerary complex existed in the early Marinid period. Initially, people were simply buried alongside the old mosque of Shalla without constructing any new additional monument. This list shows the members of the dynasty buried there in the period. In 1284, the first to be buried there was Umm Iz, the wife of Abu Yusuf, uh, followed uh, two years later by the Sultan himself, and then later by two other sultans. These burials cor uh, correspond with phase three of the site when it was simply a mosque surrounded by a perimeter wall. Then a significant change took place after Abu Hassan had ascended to the throne in 1331. The sultan established a mausoleum for his father, Abu, Abu Sa'id, in which his mother, Al Anbar, was also interred. The same Sultan Abu Hassan expanded the mosque and added the Zawiyah next to it, which correspond with phase four. It can be added that the same Sultan Abu Hassan also attempted to glorify his ancestors, which is evident from the inscriptions commissioned by him, unfailingly mentioning the, pre the previous Sultans as muqaddas or sanctified. This epithet, uh, epithet might imply that it was not simply their inherent quality as rulers, but mostly their attributed sanctity that made their funerary complex acceptable to potential religious opponents. In addition, the Sultan made several endowments for the maintenance and operation of the site, including the continuous recitation of the Quran in the tombs, as well as the feeding of the poor in the Zawiyah. One of the possible interpretations of Shalla, as I argued today, is its contribution to the construction of the satanic image in 14th century Morocco. Since the Marinids made much effort not only to patronize buildings, but also to enhance the site's popularity and perceived sanctity, 
Shallah emerged as a means of communication between the Sultan and his subjects. This, place, this was a place to propagate the dynasty's accomplishments. The references to, the references to paradise and the Kaaba, that is two transcendental places created by God, would have underpinned the principle of rulership. The Sultan is God's able and legitimate ruler, the deputy, his deputy on earth. Indeed, some visitors' perception of the site indicates that they understood the Sultan's status, drawing a link between paradise and its earthly representation, as well as between the Kaaba and the funerary complex. On a final note, this I hope establishes a more plausible framework than the hitherto predominant interpretation of the site, stating the Shalla functioned as the resting place for warriors of jihad, holy war against Christians in Abandons. This interpretation was first proposed in 1922 by André Basset and Évariste Lévy Provençal, two eminent French scholars, on the ground that some of the sultans buried as Shalla had participated in jihad against Christians in Spain. Since then, a number of scholars, some of whom were averse to agreeing on virtually any other point, still adopted the same view. It is even persistent today. However, I must say that after years of investigating this hypothesis, I have failed to find any source that praises the Marinid sultans primarily for their participation in jihad. Conversely, many of the people buried there, especially female members of the dynasty, had apparently nothing to do with jihad. I therefore believe that if one aims to find a general interpretation for Shalla, that must be a more inclusive one. The Marinid dynasty, by making use of the piety and sanctity attributed to both female and male members of their family, created a place of royal presence. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thank you very much, Peter, for this fascinating lecture. Uh, well, you can imagine the amount of wonderful memories that this talk is bringing back to my mind. Um, just um, for those who may not be familiar with the side, I'd just like to flag up that uh, the Islamic uh, complex of Shalla develops on a site which was previously occupied by a Mauritanian and Roman town, which is known with the name of Sala. And, and indeed, uh, this was one of the sites that I looked at during my doctoral research um, on the architectural ornament and urban history of Roman Morocco. And well, I can only say that among the many sites I visited in Morocco, this is definitely where my heart belongs. Uh, it is just fascinating how the Roman remains that have been excavated are still visible today alongside the Islamic period remains of Shalla and how the two can coexist, creating this uh, wonderful atmosphere, which I think is probably quite unique. Um, so apart from that, we do have time now for questions. Um, for those of you who may have joined us a bit late, uh, just to remind that if you have a question, please type your question in the Q&A box. I will read then your question to Peter and he will be happy to reply. So I see that we've got one question already uh, by John Mason, uh, who's asking, what is the connection, if any, of the earlier rulers of the 14th century and the lineage of the prophet Muhammad and then with the present leadership of Morocco. Yes, thank you very much for, uh, for that question. The first thing is that the Marinid dynasty by themselves are not 
uh, descendants of the of the prophet. They are not Shurafa. However, there are intermarriages between the Shurafa who are exactly in this period, in parallel with the development of the the advancement of the Marinid dynasty, become particularly influential in Morocco, basically for the first time, at least for the first time since the Idrisid period. So the Marinid rulers had some sort of an ambiguous relationship with the Shurafa in general. They definitely needed to make peace with them. They tried to curry favor with them, which manifested in various um, in various um, in various ways. One of which was actually marrying uh, some Shurafa, and indeed several of the wives of uh, Marinid sultans were of Shurafa um, descent. This is the general uh, concept about the, this is the general point about, about how they are interlinked with the descendants of the prophet. But then uh, we also know about particularly inimical relationships between them. So there is this ongoing uh, sort of back and forth between uh, who is, who can claim more legitimacy, more power, more social power in 14th century Morocco, which is a fascinating topic on itself, uh, in itself. Um, especially because it also manifests in patronage, in patronage of architecture, in patronage of inscriptions, um, which has been only been uh, only began to be recognized uh, in recent scholarship. The main point uh, is that uh, the Marinids at the end fail to to make peace with the Shurafa, and actually the overthrowing of the Marinid dynasty uh, is something in which the Shurafa had quite an active role. As for the second part of the question, um, I'm not entirely sure I understand. So it's the connection between the Marinid rulers and the present leadership of Morocco. I'm well, sure. in, um, so the present dynasty, the Arabi dynasty, they claim Sharif, uh, Sharifi descent. So they are claimed to be uh, descendants, of, uh, descendants of the prophet, but nothing uh, there's no direct link with the dynasty, uh, the Marinid dynasty in 14th century Morocco, at least in terms of um, in terms of family uh, descendancy. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I I really think that you raised many interesting points um, in your presentation, um, especially some of the revisions that you advanced about some of the traditional views advanced at the, in the previous studies of the complex, especially what you said at the end about the jihad and the fact that probably we don't have that much evidence uh, about that. I think it's really important to highlight. Um, it, so it's precisely thanks to studies like yours, which look at these details, um, looking also at the archaeology of architecture that really we can get um, more information about a, a complex and a site like this one and um, not just the funerary complex itself but also the broader side because uh, so this funerary complex was encompassed within a, a large ribat and where probably we also have traces of other structures I'm thinking in particular of something which was published quite recently uh, by Stefano Camporeale in his study actually of the Roman period Capitolium, which is a building which was located roughly to the north of the Islamic funerary complex. Um, when, that com when, the, when the Capitolium was excavated back in the 1960s, of course, uh, most of the later evidence was just cleared away as it used to happen in those years. Uh, so we don't have that many archeological traces left of the Islamic phases, but luckily some photographs and some drawings were made at the time of the excavations revealing that indeed there was a building phase, a transformation phase, which probably we can date in the Islamic period and providing evidence uh, of the presence probably of a residential building or a building whose plan resembles some of the residences of the same period in other known Islamic complexes. So I was wondering if 
you think the kind of study you're doing could also provide more information about the broader setting of the funerary complex within Shalla and maybe even beyond that? Uh, absolutely, yes. So one, the, the, the most important point I should make is that we don't have evidence for over 90% of the site in the 14th century. We don't have any evidence for what was going on there. So basically we are looking at truly the most important part, the funerary complex of the entire site, but this is still only a fraction of the entire picture. And the reason why we don't have evidence is partly as you, as you mentioned, is because it was demolished while excavating the Roman buildings underneath them. So not only in the Capitolium, but also in the, all around the Roman, um, the Roman town that has been partly excavated. There are many places where we have uh, bits and pieces of evidence of some Islamic structure once existing there, but nothing of that survives. And yet the, the even uh, larger point, the, the, uh, the even larger question is what happened elsewhere, which has never been excavated. So the ramparts are over a kilometer long surrounding the site. It is 64,000 square meters, uh, the entire place, and we just simply don't know what was happening in most of this place. And that is the perhaps the most important uh, thing I can say about this. But the other point is that um, many of the Roman buildings, not only the Capitolium, but some buildings were actually actively reused, uh, the most important of which is the Nymphaeum. Mm -hmm. So we have this fabulously preserved uh, Nymphaeum that was quite clearly reconstructed into some sort of an oratory a uh, square building that had a mihrab on the Qibla site. This is just next to the funerary complex, as well as uh, in most of the other cases, we only have traces of uh, Islamic remains. Um, in, in, many, in many cases, I, all I could do is document what is there, but it's like bits and pieces of walls that in themselves don't make too much sense, don't add too much to the general interpretation of the site. But as for the Cap Capitolium in particular, I was very happy to discuss this with uh, Stefano when he was writing his, uh, his book, which was exactly at the time when I was submitting my, my PhD. Uh, so it was quite an interesting insight exactly at the moment while I was writing uh, up uh, many of these things. Indeed. Right, so <clears throat> we've got actually a series of questions by uh, Zine Baskawi, uh, <clears throat> who's asking, was the designation of Shalla as a Marunid funerary site due to an unplanned or accidental death of Umal Idzids in 1284? And then related to this one, who might the visitors have been or where would they have come from? Was it the communities living nearby in the ancient Medina in Kasbah? And does the court move seasonally to Shalla uh, or would the court remain in Fes? And then we've got other questions, but first maybe you would like to answer these. Okay, so to start with the first one, this is, I believe, one of the most interesting questions why is Shalla at the time um, um, a compound of ruins, basically, uh, was chosen as the burial ground of the Marinid Sultans? And uh, to be perfectly honest, I don't have an answer to that. This is something that has been, has been puzzling me uh, for nearly a decade by now, and yet I don't have an answer. All we know is that prior to the Marinid uh, dynasty, several sources describe it as nothing but an abundant place of ruins. So there was an earlier Islamic settlement at the site, but apparently nothing of that survives to the early Marinid period. So when Umm al uh, dies, well, yes, she died an unplanned accidental death, uh, but why she was buried at Shalla is simply, is simply unknown. Don't know. All we know is that it was presumably the Sultan her husband, who chose this as the burial ground um, for his family. But again, we don't have any explanation uh, as to the phenomenon. What is, however, important is that, that at, the at, at that point, there is definitely nothing but an old mosque, which was probably restored uh, 
uh, at the time, but nothing else seems to have so uh, seem to have existed around uh, around that. Moving on to the second question, who might be the visitors? Um, who might the visitors have been? And yes, uh, so we have uh, we have descriptions of these ceremonious funerals that I mentioned. Uh, both in, in historical chronicles, as well as in some of the inscriptions, interestingly. And the inscriptions like to brag about how influential and important people came directly to this, uh, to the event of the funeral. And quite often what you see is like the enumeration of all the, all the Shurafa, all the nobles of Fez, uh, all the most influential people, the nobles, the most notables of the dynasty, of course, the royal court, uh, as well as all the state dignitaries, uh, as well as as well as the general public. So at least the impression I can have on the basis of textual sources is that the Marinids really did their absolute best to make as important people uh, to be present at the site as possible. It is definitely not only those who live in the neighborhood, uh, mm -hmm. quite specifically uh, people in people from Fes are uh, mentioned. And there is one occasion that is the burial of Al-Anbar, um, the mother of Abu Hassan, who dies in 1337 while she's on Hajj to Mecca. And on the way back, uh, she, uh, she dies. And this is the time when the Sultan Abu Hassan is besieging the town of Tlemcen. And the sources say that there was this, um, this um, procession all the way from Tlemcen to Shalla. So that was quite a, a, a monumental um, uh, procession all the way to all, all across the, the state. Um, so then I think the next question so, is- I'm Sorry, there was one, one additional, additional question here. This, does the court move seasonally to Shalla for yeah. purposes of jihad? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, no. The court is mm -hmm. never at Shalla or anywhere nearby, but it's always mm -hmm. in fast. Mm -hmm. see. Um, about inscriptions, um, if there are any inscriptions mentioning the intervention of, uh, intervention of the Sultan on behalf of the people in matters they are asking God for, like we see two centuries later, with Saadi and mausoleums in Marrakesh. I'm trying to think. There are definitely there are definitely textual descriptions of going to to Shalla and uh, asking for Shafa, ah, but it would be. Uh, I believe it would be more in the later period when there are a number of Sufi saints buried there, as well as some of the Marinid sultans, at least in the later periods, more recently, uh, turned into some sort of abstract uh, saintly figures. As from the, from the Marinid period, I can't really think of anything like that, uh, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, the thing is that it's it's quite a problematic point in uh, in Islam of who is entitled to do the shafa uh, and who's not. So technically, uh, a, a dead sultan, to the best of my knowledge, at least according to Orthodox Islam, is not exactly entitled to have that power. Uh, but this is surely debated in uh, in uh, various other um, aspects of the of the of the religion. However, one thing that I, 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 I should add is that there is a direct link between the Saadi and Muslims and uh, the Saadi and tombs in Marrakesh and the site of Shalla. And that is uh, when uh, Ahmed al Mansur builds the main complex in the Saadi and Muslim. It is quite known in contemporary sources that he searches around. Uh, for what sort of um, models he can adopt, not only for his uh, for his funerary complex, but also for his palace that is known as the Badia Palace in Marrakesh. And it is quite likely that he adopts uh, both the functional as well as uh, some architectural elements from Shalla 
to create his own uh, funerary complex, uh, where he also incorporates a tombstone that belonged to the Marinid Sultan Abu Hassan and that is still today present in the, in the two centuries later Saadian funerary complex. Right. Um, so if there are no further questions, uh, I don't see any coming from the audience. So I think we can probably finish here. And well, I'd like Peter to thank you again for such an interesting talk. Um, it was really, really enjoyable to listen. My pleasure. To I thank you very much. <laughs> so you, you, the work you're doing is really very important and I really appreciate that. Um, just before we go, I'd like to remind people of our next Society's Lecture, which will be on Tuesday, the 29th of March. And this lecture will take us to modern Libya with a talk on Anglo-Libyan relations in the 20th century by Rupert Willock. So we hope to see many of you there as well. So thank you very much and thank you, Peter, again. Thank you so much, Juan. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to close the meeting now. Thank you very much, Pauline, for your help. It's uh, much appreciated. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.